here and today we have a special service because we have all of our campuses that are tuning in with us we're starting a big big uh, series soul winning which I believe can is probably the most important series that we could do but the way the way Arizona's with us today let's give them a hand the way Oregon the way the way LA the way Arrowhead the way Pomona the way Kenya the way Tijuana the way Uganda and all the over 100 churches over there and everyone that is tuning in all over the world to hear this message today so we just let's give them one more hand as as they're here with us today I thank God for our church and I that we're focusing on this major major move of what God wants to do we just came out of a series about the Holy Spirit and Jesus told the disciples that to go out there and reach the whole world and tell everyone in the world about Jesus but he said but he said before you do that make sure you get filled and baptized with my spirit because you can't do this without my help it's a supernatural assignment to go throughout the world all we could do is share Jesus with people and it's God's spirit that touches people sets them free heals them and gives them eternal life isn't that awesome that God will do a miracle through every single one of us whether you're in Arizona and, or you're in Tijuana or Guatemala you know what we're seeing is that Jesus is the same everywhere and, and when we share Jesus he does the same things everywhere the only places that Jesus is not moving is where he is not shared that means God wants us God's always the Holy Spirit's always looking to save a soul set someone free do you know there's demonized people everywhere do you know there's people hurting everywhere there's sick people everywhere and Jesus is a healer everywhere Jesus is a deliverer everywhere Jesus gives hope to the hopeless everywhere Jesus gives eternal life everywhere Jesus forgives sins everywhere that he is preach or where he is mentioned our responsibility is to mention Jesus and when we mention him there's a scripture that says that God inhabits the praises of his people and what that means is where where God is lifted up God's presence comes in that room and manifests I want you to know this God is everywhere but he's not manifesting everywhere that means that we're not seeing pow the power of God move everywhere because it's a partnership between mankind believers and God when we do our part God promises this everywhere you go I'll be with you there's a scripture that says and and lo I'll be with you everywhere even to the ends of the earth what God is saying there's not a place that you lift my name up where I won't begin to touch souls set them free give them eternal life give them a new beginning give them my joy give them my peace isn't it great that God wants to use everyone one of us in Pomona in LA or Arizona or Uganda or Tijuana anywhere we preach the gospel I, I just want to just one more shout out for our children's ministry uh, we, I mean they, they, that thing they took over 500 kids up there uh, I don't know about you I, I, I got three grandchildren and just three grandchildren at home is a handful for me right I need a break after just one session imagine having these kids up there four days in a row and, and all of them experiencing Jesus as their Lord and Savior Thank God for Susie and that team and all the volunteers that went up there. Wow, what a job that was, and they did it. And I, I think Susie's not here today. I don't know, maybe she is, but she's, she works hard. I mean, but I hope she just takes a little break and recuperates, right? Um, so today we're going to be talking about soul winning, but before we do, let's pray that we'll hear the most important message. Every campus will hear it. And by the time we're done, we leave with a conviction that I got a responsibility to reach people and I can do it. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity we have to study your word. And I thank you, Lord, that your spirit is in every person, every campus. You're here available to every single person. And I just thank you, Lord, that you said if you be lifted up, you'll draw people to you. You'll draw them in. So we just thank you. Our responsibility, we're going to lift you up. And I thank you, Lord, you're going to bring them in. I think our, our sons and daughters are going to come in on so, in this, this month. We're believing. Our friends and relatives are coming. Father, we're, our, our husbands and wives are coming. 
Our parents are coming. Our cousins are coming. We're believing. We're going to lift your name up. We're going to let them know about you. And you're going to touch them. And they're going to be saved. They're going to be set free. And we're going to baptize them in your name. And they'll live for you for the rest of their lives. It's starting today. We declare this month a soul winning month for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I want to start off with attitude. Uh, and we're going to talk about Jesus' attitude to, about people's readiness to be reached. And I know this, if we don't really believe that people need Jesus or want Jesus, we're probably not going to share Jesus. I really believe that people need Jesus. I also believe that people want Jesus. They just don't know. In Matthew 9, 36, we look at Jesus, and this is what he says about people. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. He didn't look at the crowds and wanted to judge them or put them down and look at them and say, look how evil they are. He had compassion for them. And we're going to be, we'll be great soul winners when we have compassion for the hurting and the broken. We got to make sure that we don't forget where we came from. Remember those that have been saved, how broken, how hurt you were. You were abused, you were abandoned, maybe you were addicted, super depressed, full of anxiety, hopeless, wanted to die. But and then someone shared Jesus with you because they loved you and had compassion for you. And they remembered where they, where they were and they remembered... And they remember being depressed. They remember being addicted. They remember feeling like a failure. They didn't look down on you, but they shared Jesus with you. And maybe they told you, what Jesus did for me, he can do for you. I was in the same place you were. And I remember when my daughter had cancer. When my daughter had cancer, I was in the cancer ward with a whole bunch of little children that had cancer. It's a, it's a, it can be a very depressing place. Every day, there were one or two kids that were dying or, or leaving, they were, or really got really sick. And, and I would look around, and it looked like there was no hope around me. But once in a while, I'd hear a story of a survivor, someone that had the same cancer my daughter had. And they came back and said, my daughter or my son had the same cancer your son, your daughter has. And he, he overcame it. He went into complete remission. And just one story of someone that survived, build my faith. And I'm going to tell you, God didn't just save you, but he wants you to be a survival story. He wants you to be a testimony to somebody else and let them know, I've been where you're at, but Jesus saved me. But Jesus had compassion for the people because they were troubled and helpless. You know what that means? He felt their pain. And he understood they were helpless. Without his intervention, they would never overcome what they were facing. Like sheep without a shepherd, they needed leadership. Then he said to his disciples, the size of the harvest is bigger than you can imagine. Jesus had a real positive outlook about people needing him or needing salvation. we got to believe that there's a whole world out there that if we let them know about Jesus, they would say yes. They do want friendship. They do want love. They do want a new beginning. They do want security of their salvation. They do want their marriages to work out. They do want to overcome their depression. They do want to overcome their addictions. But someone has to let them know. So he said, the harvest is bigger than you can imagine. But there are few workers. So Jesus addresses the problem. There's not a problem with a demand, because there's a demand. There's a problem with workers that are willing to work and bring in the harvest. He, and so a lot, there's a lot of believers, there's a lot of believers working on many things but never, not a lot of believers working on the greatest mission in the world, soul winning. Now, it's okay 
to work on your business, work on your career, work on becoming better at some hobby. All those things are wonderful. Work on cleaning your garage, work on cleaning your house, work on your physical health, work on eating better. All those things are great. But be careful that you're working really hard on all those areas and you're not working on saving the souls of your children, saving the souls of your friends, and saving the souls of your community. So Jesus says there's a harvest that's ripe. There's a lot of people that are hurting out there and they need love. There's another thing the Bible says about soul winning. It says everyone who is focused on soul winning is wise. Say it with me. Everyone that's focused on soul winning is wise. Now, the, 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 the verse that we get that from is Proverbs 11.30. It says the fruit of those who are right with God is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. Wise. Now, when I, when I thought about that word, I had to look up the original word. And the original word is prudent. And when I looked up the word I go, prudent, I still don't know what that means. And this is what it means. It's one who is careful in providing for the future, having foresight, and it's well prepared. Let's leave it at that. So a person that's wise prepares and provides for their future. To make it real simple, we are wise if we save money for the future or for a rainy day. We are not wise if we give all our money to Taco Bell and Del Taco and McDonald's. And the reason I say that because because I think one of the big expenses today are food. And you know why we, go, we do fast food? Because we don't want to cook. Do you know it's cheaper to cook at home than it is to go out there and eat with your family every night? But it's wise to prepare for your future. It's wise to save up for a rainy day. And the ultimate wisdom is to prepare for your spiritual future, for your eternal life. And what he's saying, someone that's focusing on soul winning is a wise person, is prudent, because he's making sure he's prepared for eternity, and he's making sure his friends and relatives are prepared for eternity. Because if your family is not saved and you've not won them over for Jesus, it doesn't matter what you've gained on this earth. You will lose them for eternity. There's one thing my mom did that was we were wise. You know, we didn't have the nicest cars when we grew up. As a matter of fact, most of the cars we have, we just had to pray to get to the next location. Anybody got a car like that? You just had to pray. I mean, I remember, I remember my mom picking me up from, from school and it was a rainy day. We didn't even have wipers. The wipers didn't work because the car had electrical problems. So every every few miles, we'd have to stop. I mean, even the, 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 the froster didn't work. So every few miles, we'd have to stop, and I'd have to clean the window and just clean the window inside and, and try to wipe off, <laughs> wipe off the windshield, and then we'd just go for a few more miles. I remember praying for our car. I remember we had a car that um, could, it wouldn't go over 40 miles per hour. And it's scary on the freeway because you're pressing on the gas and that car's... And people are blocking the horn on the freeway and we're going as fast as we can. I remember growing up and I remember that uh, some people came and stole our car. And I go, Ma, they're stealing the car. They weren't stealing the car. They were being, it was being repossessed. We didn't have the, not always the nicest cars. But I knew this, my mom did something real wise. She made sure that she won, she won a soul, and the soul that she won is me. And she made sure that I was forgiven. I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. My parents might not have provided everything, but they provided salvation for me. And today, I'm a soul winner, and that means she raised a wise son because she was a wise mama. So be careful that you're not so busy making sure your kids are good at soccer and they don't even know Jesus. Be careful that you're not giving them five bucks for an A 
and they're not even saved yet. Give the five bucks to them. No problem. Give them 10 bucks. If they get straight A's, give them a hundred bucks. But make sure that you also reward them when they memorize a scripture, when they get, come on, when they're praying. Let them know, I'm so proud of you when you're sharing your faith. Let's raise up some wise children, some wise young adults. Come on, let's raise up a wise next generation that don't just come to church, but they're soul winners. Is that right? So we have a 30-day mission statement, and this is what it, is what it is. Everyone win one for Jesus. Everyone win one for Jesus. Say it with me. Everyone win one for Jesus. Let's say it again. Everyone win one for Jesus. The title of this sermon is, I am a soul winner. So my pronoun is, I'm a soul winner. I'm just kidding. What's your pronoun? Soul winner. I know we got to cover that. But there's five, I want, there's a survey that they did about, about the unchurched. And if you're unchurched and you're here, they, they did a survey and it was a two-year survey and they hit all the 50 states of, of, of the United States and they also hit Canada and they found some surprises about the unchurched. And the reason I'm going to share these surprises because I want you to have a good attitude about reaching and have an attitude of positivity about reaching your neighbor. Surprise number one, most of the unchurched prefer to attend church on Sunday morning if they attend. This is what one of the people said that unchurched is. If I attended church, it would be the only time I could go regularly, said Al V of Tulsa. We, we almost always have some activity that one of our kids is involved with on Saturdays. I just think Sunday is the best time for me. It's not that they won't come on a Wednesday night and they won't come on another day. But on Sunday, people that are unchurched think about if I was going to church, it would be on Sunday. And if that's the case, we need, to, we need to always be inviting people to come with us on Sunday. If you have an extra seat in your car, it's not so you could have some leg room. You have some extra seat in your car so you could bring somebody on Sunday to church. There's still some room in this church. Surprise number two. Most of the unchurched feel guilty about not, about not attending church. These guilty feelings were especially prevalent among adults who had ch live, children living at home. This is what Mary said. Every Sunday morning, I wake up and feel terrible about not taking Sh Shana and Tim to church. Mike, her husband, feels the same way. He said this, it's tough to start a habit of doing something you've never done before. All, all this is, is saying is that they need some help to push them to something they feel they should do anyways. Because if you're a parent, you know you have a responsibility to teach them, yes, you want to make sure they read and write. You want to make sure they do well in school. You want to make sure they're socially well, well socially adjusted and do well at what they do. But you also know this, I got a responsibility to make sure my children know about God. It's my responsibility to raise them in the way they should go so when they're older, they won't depart. Surprise number three, look at this surprise. 96% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend if they were just invited. That means nine out of 10 people, if they were just invited, they would most likely attend if they were invited. But this is the problem. There's 160 million people unchurched in America. And that means that uh, if, we, if we started inviting, 153 million people would be willing to come. Should, could it be all we need is an invitation revolution? That we just invite people like we used to invite them to party. Some of you guys used to be professional promoters. Sin promoters. Right? Party promoters, club promoters, right? Weed promoters, drug promoters, right? Some, some of us. But whatever it was, you used to promote something else besides Jesus. So why don't we, why wouldn't we as believers 
pushing the best product in the world, Jesus Christ, the one that saves, the one that gives eternal life, the one that makes us whole. Why wouldn't we just start an invitation revolution? Let's start it today. The problem and the question is, are Christians inviting non-Christians to church? Well, the heartbreaking answer is no. Christians are not inviting non-Christians to church. What's the percentage? Only 2% of Christians invite the unchurched. 2%. In a year, only 2% of the 100% of believers will invite someone to church. The enemy, the devil, is okay you coming to church as long as we don't get involved in the mission of saving souls. Jesus does not fill you with his Holy Spirit Fill me and you with his spirit. Give us his gifts of his spirit. Give us life for us just to coast through, survive, and go into eternity. We are here with a purpose. And the purpose is while we're here, we got an opportunity to share Jesus with someone that needs Jesus. And I want to show up in heaven. I don't want to show up alone. I want to show up with thousands and maybe millions of people that we have reached because we knew we had a purpose. There's one thing I can't do in heaven. And the thing I can't do in heaven is tell people about Jesus. Surprise number four. Very few of the unchurched had someone share with them how to become a Christian. I, I once in a while will talk to waitresses or, or, or ta- if I'm on vacation, a taxi driver. And, and a lot of these people run into thousands of people that they have contact with within their career. And they run into a lot of Christians. And then... I'll get to it. I'll share the good news of Jesus Christ. And then I'll ask them, out of the thousands of tables you've waited on or hundreds of tables you waited on, has anybody ever shared Jesus with you? And I've not had really one say, really, someone shared Jesus with me. They told me how to be saved. They told me how to be a Christian. This is what's happening We're eating, we're dropping off a tip, but we're not even bringing Jesus into the equation. And I'm not saying you got to witness every time you have a waitress, but you should be looking for the opportunity. You should be looking for the opportunity with your coworkers. Be careful that you don't go on vacation with your friends and you guys play dominoes and you do all kinds of fun activities and you never once mention Jesus. What kind of friend are you? Your friends are going to hell and you got no time to mention Jesus. All I'm saying, good friends don't let their friends go to hell. Not on my watch. If you're in my family and you're in my circle, you're going to have a hard time going to hell. Because until you get saved, I'm going to keep on mentioning Jesus. I have some of my relatives that think they're saved. And I tell them, you ain't saved. (laughs) And the reason I tell you you ain't saved, because you're practicing sin. There's been no conversion. You might be religious. You call, I mean, you name drop Jesus, but you don't serve him. Hey, man, you know, Marco, you're kind of rough with me. I'm not trying to be rough with you, uncle. I'm trying, I love you too much to make you think that you're okay and you're not. And as long as I'm alive and me and you have a conversation, it's going to always come back to this because I want to see you now and I want to see you in eternity. Uncle, I love you. Amen. Surprise number five. Most of them in church have a positive view of pastors, ministers in the church. The reason we're covering this is we got to break all this negative thoughts that we think they don't want to know. They do want to know. Oh, they, they, think, they think the church is full of hypocrites. Now, only a few said that, that the ministers are hypocritical only, only after money and have a condescending view of others. Only a few thought that. The majority of the unchurched still think that the church is relevant today. Indeed, many of them perceive the church to be the most relevant institution in our society today. 
The unchurched think that the church is the most relevant, most relevant institution in our society today because he knows that the church deals with things that the world can't deal with. They deal when someone's struggling and, and I, you know, I, I, had, I had someone that they felt their, their daughter was demonized, possessed, and saying things they shouldn't be saying. Well, they didn't call emergency. They didn't call the police. They didn't call 911. They called me. Because they, they knew I got a spiritual problem. Some of you guys have a marriage problem, but you have a spiritual problem. And until God fixes you, your marriage is not going to be fixed. You have a depression problem, but it's a spiritual problem. You have a fear problem, but it's a spiritual problem. You have an addiction problem, but it's a spiritual problem. The biggest problems that you have, no man can fix. But there's one. The Bible says, whoever calls upon that name, that name, you call on it, you'll be saved. You'll be made whole. You'll be set free. You can receive eternal life. So what is, this is the question we're going to end it with and we're going to answer this question. What is at stake if we don't tell anyone about Jesus and focus on soul winning? What if we don't tell anybody about Jesus and we never focus on soul winning? This is the first thing. No one will ever believe in Jesus or call on him to save them. I remember on vacation, I'm on vacation and, and I ran into a lady that I ran into a lady, I'm not going to get into all the details, but I ran into a lady and she told me, she told me that, I, I, I asked her, do you go to church? She goes, yeah, we, we kind of go, I, we go to Catholic church and then, and then once in a while we go to Christian church and they're just kind of, this is what they were doing. But then I asked her a real serious question. I said, you know, I'm here on vacation and we're having a conversation and you matter to me because I might never see you again. And I don't think there's a coincidence that you're talking to me. But I'm going to ask you a real straight question. If today were your last day on earth, do you know where you'd spend eternity? And I, and, I, and I said, this is a real relevant question. Because every single person on earth will die. Do you know what happens after death? Your spirit moves on. The Bible says there's judgment after death. And this is what I'm asking. There's only two locations. There's heaven forever and there's hell forever. Hell is for those that never gave their lives to Jesus, were never forgiven of their sins. Hell was created for the devil and his fallen angels. It wasn't prepared for you. Jesus said when he was on earth, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Jesus was saying this, I prepared heaven for you. Imagine, he created the heavens and the earth as we see it today in six days. But since Jesus left, he's been creating a heaven for us. Imagine how beautiful, how powerful that place is. You don't want to miss the place created for you. And it would be a shame that you do well in business. You make all the money because she was, she was doing some business. You drive all the cars you want. You live in the house you want. You're wearing all the designer clothes that you're wearing. But at the end, you and your family and your kids end up lost for eternity in hell forever. How would you feel? Would you think that you misprioritize your life? Would that be the biggest oops of your life? She goes, I've never thought about that. I've kind of just casually looked at it. But I've never put my heart in it. Well, my responsibility is to let you know that the most important decision you'll ever make is the salvation of your soul. Jesus died for your sins because there was a price to pay for your sins. He was punished on your behalf so you and I could be forgiven. And then I ask her straight up, do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now? She goes, yes. She was in a business atmosphere. I don't care where I'm at. I'll do it in the middle of a hotel lobby. I'm not ashamed. I'm talking about winning a soul. I'll probably never see that lady again until I get into heaven. But I'm not just doing some vacation because I don't go, I'm not going on vacation from soul winning because I don't witness, I am a witness. Jesus didn't fill me with his spirit to go witnessing. He filled me with his spirit to be a witness. 
So she gave her life to Jesus right there. She goes, thank you so much. And that's how we do it. I'm working on another lady right now that I did business with this week. I'm going to visit her Monday. Why? Because we ain't done yet. She just, right now she's just getting warmed up. Amen. Come on. Say with me, I'm a soul winner. Say with me, I'm a soul winner. Say with me, I'm a soul winner. I love it. Because when you're talking about soul winning, you're talking about the most relevant subject in the world. Everybody needs salvation. See, only those that have heard the good news about Jesus will call on him to save them. That means unless they hear about him, they'll never call on Jesus or have the faith to believe in him. God has set this up that if we share, he will invade their heart with faith, with belief, with conviction. And then he, the power of God's spirit will save them. But the Holy Spirit can't go to work on a soul if he's never, if Jesus is never mentioned. Our job is to mention Jesus. Our job is to share our testimony. Our job is to let them know what Jesus did for them. It's God's job to save them. But we got to mention him. Romans 10, 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? That's true. No one's going to call on Jesus to set them free and give them eternal life and save them from the repercussions and the misery of their sin if they've never heard about him. It's our responsibility. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? Well, it's a rhetorical question. They can't. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And all God is saying, if we don't tell them, they can't be saved. They'll never call on Jesus to save them, even though they need him. There's someone right now that's suicidal. And they're one message away from being saved. But if we don't reach them, they're going to kill themselves. And you know what happens if they kill themselves and our friends go to hell on our watch and we never mention Jesus to them, their blood will be on our shoulders. It's getting quiet in here. Arizona, are you guys with me? Pomona, are you with me? The way LA, are you with me? The way Kenya, Tijuana, Mexico. We are the answer for this nation. We are the answer for our cities. We are the answer for the crazy families that we were born in. You were born in a crazy, messed up family, not to criticize them, but to bring them the good news of Jesus Christ and let them know, I know I'm crazy just like you, but Jesus saved me. You know how I used to be. He saved me. And that same Jesus that saved me can save you, mama, can save you, daddy, can save you, cousin, can save you, bro. Look at this in Ezekiel 33, 3. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, back in those days, they'd have watchmen that would stand high on the, maybe in a watchtower. And if they seen the enemy coming, is their responsibility was to blow the trumpet and get everybody for war. To warn them, the enemy's coming. We must warn this world, this generation, the end is coming. There'll be a day that you die, you breathe your last breath. Judgment is coming. Make sure you're wise and you're prepared, not only for this life, but you're prepared for the next life. What is a prophet, a person to gain the whole world and then lose their soul? Don't get distracted with temporary pleasure and make temporary pleasure your God. Some are living for the next high. Some are living for the next girl they're with, the next guy they're with, the next porn, porn night. They're thinking, what's the next sin I'm going to be involved with? Understand this. That sin will distract you to the point that it will take you and make you blind to your reality that one day you'll stand before God. There's not a sin that you cannot be forgiven of. Thank God when Jesus died, he died for every single sin 
but there's no way to get to heaven without calling on Jesus. Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me. But when a watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Good job. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. If I share Jesus with that young lady and she refuses to listen, it's not my fault. When she stands before God one day, don't go through the records. I never heard. Oh, hold on, hold on. Do you remember that crazy Puerto Rican guy? <laughs> he told you. I can't, I can't force nobody to give up their sin and here follow Jesus and have the best, the best life you've ever wanted, the life you've always wanted. I can't force you to get set, to, to give up the thing that's destroying you and your family. You got to make up your mind to do that. You got to be sick and tired of, of the misery. You got to be sick and tired of the depression. You got to be sick and tired of the cycles of destruction. You got to be sick and tired of messing everything up. You got to be sick and tired of the failure. You got to be sick and tired of the anger, the burst of anger. You got to make up your mind. I'm sick and tired of it. But, but I like that. I like that. She said it loud. I love that. She couldn't even hold it in. I said, I'm done. Amen. That's what the, you know who made her say that? Jesus, the Holy Spirit. But the problem is if, 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 if I warn them and they don't listen, it's not that I don't care. It's just not my, resp I, they're, they're, resp my, they're not my responsibility. I did my part. But look what it says here. They heard the alarm, but ignored it. So there is, the responsibility is theirs. That's verse five, Ezekiel 33, five. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. Just think about this. This is the most important message you'll ever hear in your life. If you ignore this warning that you need to be saved, that I need to be saved, and there's only one name, you've messed up because once you die, there's no makeup test. If they would listen, to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchmen, which are, are us, see the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for, for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchmen responsible for their deaths. Wow. You know what this is called? Just feeling the weight of the responsibility. Be careful that you're not don't let fear overcome your mission. Because there's times I get overwhelmed. Maybe, oh, I don't know, man. It's, it's kind of awkward right now. But God, I'm available. Let's go. And there's many times I've witnessed scared. <laughs> and then when I step in, it was nothing. It was like, oh. Do you know some people look rough? But deep down, they're just little teddy bears. They look like, oh man, he don't want to hear about Jesus. Right? And there's other people that look all innocent and they're wicked and wild. Like, man, she, what? But don't, but, he's, but the idea is, don't be scared. If someone, I saw it the other day, I saw it the other day, which is crazy. I don't know, it's back, back east in New York. They have some trains that are electric trains, right? So they run on electricity. So one, a guy tried to take a shortcut and run on the tracks. As soon as he ran on the tracks, he got executed. So now he's sitting on the track and he's just stuck to the track, dying. And people are watching him, but nobody wants to go in and rescue him. And they don't because they know if I go in and touch him, I'm going to be electrocuted too. But and then this young man, he goes, I'm going to go in. So he goes on the railroad tracks, he touches him, and he gets shot. Boom! 
But he goes back. He doesn't stop. He hits him again, lifts him up a little bit, gets hit again, lifts him up a little bit, finally got him off the track and saved his life. If someone's willing to die to reach a soul that who don't even know, come on, every one of us that have eternal life should be willing to lay down our lives. Come on, lay down our pride, lay down our fears, and here we go. Are you ready to do one of these here we go conversations? Like, here we go. We're going to bring up Jesus. I can see a wide open opportunity right here. And I'm not going to let this opportunity pass me by. So what if we don't share? No one believe in Jesus or call him to say, number two, our friends and family will end up in hell for eternity. That's crazy. I, you know what? Back in the day, we used to talk a lot about, a lot more about hell, fire, and brimstone. You know, part of me getting saved was I was scared to go to hell. It wasn't that I loved Jesus. I didn't want to go to hell. And I knew it was his name that I could call on to be saved. Of course, I've developed a love for Jesus. But I had to realize, man, if I keep living this way, if I die in my sins, I could end up there. 150,000 people die every single day. I wonder how many of them went to hell. If we could do something about it, we should. We cannot let our friends and relatives end up in this place without doing all we can to make sure they don't end up there. In Revelation 20, 15, scary scripture. I was witnessing to some guy in that same place. I was witnessing to that lady. As I was witnessing to that lady, a customer was in the lobby. And then I sat down and he, he comes to me, he goes, you're a pastor, huh? Because he overheard the conversation. I go, yeah. So we started talking, and I told him, this is a scary scripture. He goes, okay, I'm going to tell you a real scary scripture. He goes, what? I go, there's a, there's a scripture that says that, and this is what it means. You could be religious. You could go to church. You could do all the rosaries. You could go through all the catechisms. You could do all that. But the question is, do you have religion or do you have a relationship with Jesus? Because religion can't save you. It's knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior that can save you. Do you have religion or do you have relationship? Have you ever heard that? He goes, I never quite heard that. I go, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, I'm going to lay it on you right now. And this guy was a multimillionaire businessman. I found out later. He's sitting there. And there's a scripture that there's going to be people that stand before the Lord and he's going to say this, depart from me. I never knew you. So the question is, do you know Jesus as a friend, as your savior? Do you have a relationship with him? Because if you don't, you're going to hear these words, depart from me. I never knew you. You knew religion. You, you name drop a church. You might have said I belong to the Wayworld Outreach, but I'm asking you, do you know Jesus? Come on. You might know some people that know Jesus, but you're not going to name drop yourself into heaven. You're going to have to know Jesus for yourself. And you know what he told me? This is what he told me. He goes, that's deep. And I, you know what I told him? That's as deep as it gets. <laughs> Amen, come on. So I mentioned Jesus and it's overflowing into the lobby. And I'm going to go back. And then the girl that I went to suit, she's going to tell her boyfriend. I believe they're going to end up here in church. We're going to counsel them to get married. They're going to get saved. They're going to get baptized. Why? Because someone was willing to be, come on, come on, be inconvenienced and bring Jesus into our conversation. Everybody everywhere needs Jesus. But look at the scripture that's ended with this. Revelation 2015. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, okay, okay. Now, you don't have to be real smart to figure this out. The sentence is saying there's a book in heaven called the book of life. And at the end, when you stand before God in judgment, if your name's not written in that book, you'll be thrown into the lake of fire. This is not a metaphor. It's real. 
Don't play Russian roulette with your future. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. We just had a young man that grew up in this church, got in a car accident two days ago or three days ago with a diesel truck. He's been, he was in a coma for three days, broken, all kinds of broken bones. That young man could have went into eternity. He's still in intensive care today. We love him and we're praying for him. That God would give him a second chance to live for him. But tomorrow's not guaranteed. Today is your day to be saved. Because if you're not saved and you leave this earth without putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you must understand that this will be your future. It's scary. There's a warning. Listen to the warning. God loves you. And the last thing, we will never, if we never get involved in soul winning, we'll never experience the blessing of being a soul winner. I'm going to give you one of the blessings. Next service, I'll give two or three of them. But John 4.36 says this, the harvesters, which are the soul winners, are paid good wages. This is what he's saying. If you'll get employed by me and become a soul winner, I'm going to pay you real good wages. I'm going to take care of you because when you're taking care of my mission, I got a responsibility to take care of you. You're on my payroll now. You know what that means? Soul winners will not be in lack. God will provide everything that you need if you'll just get on his mission. He'll provide financial. He'll provide a relationship. He'll provide joy. He'll provide peace. He'll provide everything. Your lack will be eliminated when you start getting on the mission of the Lord. You cannot be on a mission of being a soul winner and be on God's employment. Come on. Be on his, come on, be on his, on his tab without him taking care of every single one of your needs. Good wages. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. So what's the harvest? People brought to eternal life. What joy awaits bo both the planter and the harvester alike? So there's a blessing of a soul winner. And one of the blessings is joy. It means a high degree of pleasure and enjoyment. This is what, this is for sure. Soul winners are happy. Soul winning is soul food. It feeds your soul. It nourishes your mind. It feeds your, come on, it feeds your relationships. You know what it does? It starts nourishing everything. It starts healing everything that's unhealthy. Soul winners are healthy mentally, spiritually, relationally, and they walk with joy. See, one of the, one of the cures for Christian depression is soul winning. Some of you guys, oh, I, need to, I just need another pill from the doctor. I just need, maybe the marijuana could solve this little depression I have in me. <laughs> maybe I just need another drink. Or maybe if I left my wife and got with the other girl at work, she makes me feel happier. Or maybe if I made more money, or maybe if I drove that, or maybe if I moved here, or maybe, and all this maybe stuff. And the problem is you're always going to feel unnourished and you're always going to feel dissatisfied until you start fulfilling your purpose to become a soul winner. Win somebody to Jesus. And I guarantee you this, you'll be the happiest you've ever been in your life. Have you ever shared Jesus with somebody and felt God's spirit flowing through you and the peace that's there after you do that? Like, man, you feel on top of it. I didn't even know I was that smart. You start coming up with stuff that you know wasn't even you. It's God speaking through you. By the time you're done with that session, sharing your faith with somebody, you feel like, man, I am. I've come a long way. Hey. And God starts confirming I'm with you. You'll start seeing miracles in you. You'll start seeing miracles in your family. you start seeing miracles in your emotions. And God is just saying, when you get on my mission, I guarantee you this, I'm going to give you a blessing. I'm going to pay you some good wages. I'm going to pay you what no one else can pay you. I'm going to give you what you've always been searching for. Does anybody want to get on Jesus' payroll? Let's all stand up. I'm going to dismiss in just a second. People want to hear about him. So these next two weeks, this, well, next week, we're going to prepare you to witness, to invite people. 
after we leave here, we're going to do it. Some of us are going to be going to Hollywood that, that want to go out there and worship. They're going to make a call of salvation. And everyone that gets saved on Hollywood Boulevard today, it's our altar team that's getting all the information. It's our church that are following up on all of them. They've given us the responsibility to do that because they know that we're a disciple-making church and we're serious about soul winning. So your church has to do it. But let's end this. I want just no more movement because it's kind of like fishing. You don't want to be throwing rocks in the middle of the lake while you're fishing. You're going to scatter the fish. Every one of you, I want to let you know this. It's as simple as it gets. God absolutely loves you. He said, man, but you know, man, I don't know him and I've been living a life apart from him. I'm doing my thing. Your sin does not stop his love for you. Jesus did not come to save a whole bunch of goody two-shoes people because I ain't one of them. He came to save some sinners that know they need a savior. I know I needed a savior. Maybe you know you need a savior. I hope you know you need a savior because you can't save yourself. Your story at the end is not going to be that you were self-made. Your story at the end is not going to be, it's not going to be, oh, I was, I was so good, God had to let me into heaven. Until you start, me and you start admitting, man, I, I got some issues. I need God to save me. I need God to set me free. I know, I feel guilty for the things I've done. I even self-sabotage myself sometimes. I don't allow myself to succeed because something within me makes me know you don't deserve to succeed. There's something in you. You know you've done wrong and you can't get over the past, the things that have been done to you and the things you've done. But it, this is what God is saying. You no longer need to live in your past. The Bible says, he that is in Christ, all things pass away, everything becomes new. That means God is going to forgive you of every single one of your sins. He's going to fill you with his spirit. He's going to make you a brand new person. He's going to give you new desires. Come on, he's going to kick the devils out of your life that have been hurting you, tormenting you, destroying you, giving you nightmares. And he's going to give you a free gift of eternal life. And then he's going to say, now you go out there and you go reach those people that were in the same place you were. And you're talking about living the life. But if you're in this room, just like I talked to that lady, if today were your last day on earth, do you know where you spend eternity? Because if you don't know where you spend eternity, then you need to know before you leave here. Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? I ask people that all the time. And you know what's so cool about that? The people that have not made Jesus the Lord of their life, they all know it. People come out, I've been coming to church six months. I go, have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? No, not yet. Well, then you're not saved yet. You got to give your life to Jesus. You got to, and you know how you come? You come the way you are. You don't fix yourself and come to God. You come with, just like you go with your dirty car to the car wash, you come with your dirty life and he's the one that fixes you. He's the one that forgives you. He armorals your life. Make it look good. Man, you're looking good. That's Jesus, man. You don't even know, okay? So I'm going to ask you, if today were your last day, do you know where you spent eternity? If you're not, Sure. Today's your day to give your life to Jesus. Or maybe you're a Christian and you backslid, but it's time to come back home. Don't wait till the repercussions and the consequences of your bad decisions get so bad that you can, it's going to be almost impossible to bounce back. Today's your day. It's not too late for you. God loves you. He wants to intervene in your life right now. He wants to restore what's been broken. There's not something you've messed up so bad that God can't turn it around. He just needs you to get, he needs you to give him permission. I'm going to count to three. Say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. But if you want to give your life to Jesus, it takes a real man and woman to be bold. Jesus died publicly for you. Will you raise up your hand when I say three and say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want forgiveness of my sins. I want to receive the gift of the eternal life. Jesus will give it to you if you call on him. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. One. When I say three, raise your hands. Two. Jesus died for your sins. He rose again from the dead. Today's your day of salvation. One, two, 
Free, raise your hands all over this building, and that's me. Proud of you, young man. Proud of you. Come on, proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of you. Anybody else? Come on. Come on, proud of you, baby. Proud of you. Proud of you. There we go. There we go. There we go. Come on, anybody else over here? Raise your hand. See the hand over there. I want those that raise their hand. I want you to do me one more big favor. Will you give me the honor and privilege of praying with you? I want you to leave your seat and just come up here. Those few steps are saying, I'm walking away from my old life. And I'm going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. I'm going to be a soul winner for the rest of my life. Come on, let's give them a hand as they're coming forward. Someone's going to be forgiven. Someone's going to be set free. Someone's going to have a brand new start. A new beginning for them, their family, their marriage. Come on. Come on, there's a couple out there. There's a couple out here that you're struggling in your marriage. And you're thinking, man, we're at the end of our rope. But God is saying, you're at the end of your rope. But when you get to the end of your rope, if you'll call on me, you'll have a new beginning. There's a couple out here. You need to step out from your seats. And both of you need to come up here right now. Because Jesus is going to restore your life, restore your marriage, restore your family. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is your moment. Come on, God's gonna do it. God's gonna do it. God's gonna do it. God's gonna do it if you step out. Do it. Proud of you. It takes a real man and woman to do this. Come on, they're still coming, church. Come on. Arizona, Pomona. Come on, everybody. Out there, Arrowhead. It's time. All right. This is what we're going to do. What's your name? Demetrius. God bless you, Demetrius. Proud of you, man. Takes a real man to do this, okay? God's been calling you, and he's going to finish the work he started in your life. Get ready, okay? God's going to have you. You're going to be evangelizing all over the world. God's going to use you. Watch, watch. He's going to have you go into the streets. You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to be on mission field. God's going to do some great things in your life. This decision, you don't even realize how great it is. Okay? What's your name, baby? Stephanie, God bless you, Stephanie. A new beginning today, okay? When Jesus touches you, he makes you whole in every area. He knows your struggles. He knows your pain. And he wants to heal you completely. Make you whole. Give you peace. Give you joy. That you'll know for sure there's somebody that loves you. And will never leave you. That's Jesus, okay, baby? Awesome, awesome. Let's do this. Proud of you guys, okay? There's nothing you've ever done that you can't be forgiven of. Church. We should not be decreasing. We should be increasing. You know when the church decreases? When the church stops soul winning. Let, we're not, come on, you're going to keep showing up and you're going to keep interceding and you're going to keep fighting. Sometimes you got to show up and just be praying right next to the empty seat. This seat represents my son. This seat represents my daughter. But I'm going to hold it down until they come and they worship God with me. We got a few seats in the back available. Come on, next Sunday, let's fill those seats. Everybody reach one. Let's pray. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus. Jesus. And I want you to say this. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I, know I know I'm a sinner. I, a sinner. I, ask, you I ask you now to forgive me forgive of all my sins. All my sins. I, believe I believe you died on the cross. On the cross. You suffered. To pay the price you were punished for me you were innocent and you took my place and then you rose from the dead thank you Jesus for calling me today to follow you today I open my heart and I ask you and I accept you as my Lord and Savior fill me now with your spirit See, heal me set me free from all depression discouragement hopelessness addiction anger torment I am free in Jesus name I thank you I receive the free gift of eternal life from this day forward I'll live for you and be a soul winner for the rest of my life 
In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Say that online. Go on igotsaved.com. I want to make sure we cover everybody here. Pray with them. Everybody that came, keep coming to church. Give us a year of your life. And I guarantee you, your life will never be the same again. One year. God bless you, church.